Uh, so good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this launch of the March 2022 edition of Parity, Homelessness and Social Work. My name is Jenny Smith, and I'm the CEO of Victoria's uh, Homelessness Peak Body, the Council to Homeless Persons. Um, this is our first parity launch of uh, 2022, and so it's just great to have this really strong level of interest from uh, right around Australia, and we have more than 150 people um, registered for this event, which is uh, just wonderful. Um, uh, if I could go no further without uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands around Australia that we are meeting on this morning, um, and uh, acknowledge that um, knowledge traditional uh, custodians, elders past, present, emerging, um, any who we are privileged to have here with us this morning and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded. I myself am here on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and I pay my respects. The other thing before I go any further is to acknowledge that uh, parity uh, would be nothing uh, without uh, uh, the people that contribute, but uh, also the people uh, who uh, sponsor the edition. So I do want to thank all the sponsors who made this edition possible before I proceed any further. So RMIT University, the University of South Australia, the Killip Family Services, Sacred Heart Mission, Unity Housing South Australia, Queensland University of Technology, the University of Melbourne, the University of the Sunshine Coast, the Australian Association of Social Workers and Multicultural Youth South Australia. I also, uh, on behalf of all of you, thank Noel Murray for his great work with you all in producing this edition of Parity. Uh, social work is incredibly important to our specialist homelessness sector. It's um, it's a, a qualification of choice uh, right across our sector. And addressing homelessness is core to so much social work practice. And now we have uh, an edition of Parity dedicated to that intersection. A an edition that showcases so much excellence in um, social work and homelessness research, education, practice models, working with those with the lived experience of being without a home, practice itself, and the experience and lessons uh, that we have learned from the whole COVID pandemic experience. And all this work is underpinned by the AASW's code of ethics. And that includes core, the core principle that the pursuit of social justice requires social workers to promote policies, practice and social conditions that uphold human rights. And the right to a home, of course, is one of the foundations of social justice. And so it is fitting that we have with us uh, Rachel Riley, who's the Manager of Social Policy and Advocacy at the AASW uh, to officially launch this edition of Parity. And Rachel uh, is a person with a commitment to human rights and specifically the rights of marginalised groups. Um, she's over a long period of time had a focus on the rights of women, particularly on uh, policy development to make sure that women can be safe and free from violence. And Rachel knows how important and critical housing is for people to be safe and healthy. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Rachel, and over to you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Jenny, for that introduction. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, I'm pretty much going to mimic what Jenny said there in terms of um, acknowledging the traditional custodians and owners of the lands on which we're all living and working on today. I'd also like to specifically acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands I'm on and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any elders that we may have in the audience today with us. Um, I'd also just from a personal perspective acknowledge that the um, lands on which we meet haven't been ceded and to that end people were dispossessed from their lands which within that cultural context also meant that they lost their home. So I think that's a really appropriate thing to acknowledge today given um, the subject matter that we will be discussing. 
Uh, so first, I'd just like to say a massive big thank you to um, Jenny and Noel and to Council, to Homeless Persons for the invitation and the opportunity to be here with everyone online to launch this um, incredibly special and significant edition of Parity, the Homelessness and Social Work Edition. Uh, on behalf of the Australian Association of Social Workers, I would really like to extend my gratitude to the Council to Homeless Persons for the incredible work that they do do as the peak body in addressing homelessness in Victoria, including producing such an informative uh, publication such as Parody. Um, as already foreshadowed and as um, the authors of the introduction of the edition note, um, the ending of homelessness is a key priority for the AASW. It is both a social justice issue and a human rights issue and is a main advocacy concern for our members and for social workers. Many of our members do work in this space and housing was deemed the second highest advocacy priority with the first being income support and clearly a bit of a, a, the, the link and the connection there. So to this end, there really is great synergy between the AASW and the Council to Homeless Persons, particularly their work in the policy space to end homelessness through developing, supporting and promoting evidence-based policy and practice. We really do look forward to continuing this important relationship well beyond today and fostering ways in which we can collectively advocate for systemic reforms, which better meet and serve the needs of the Australian community and ensure everyone has appropriate and affordable housing. As um, Jenny sort of noted, and as many in attendance uh, would know, the AASW and the social work profession has a deep commitment to social justice and human rights. And the profession looks to the International Bill of Human Rights and a, and a broad range of other human rights treaties to know what standards we should be aiming for to safeguard the human rights of peoples and communities. Um, I guess then conceptualising some of these stand standards um, are actually then in our code of ethics, which Jenny's alluded to, and which um, the articles, a number of the articles in parity have actually referenced as well. And, and clearly the right to adequate housing is a fundamental human right, which is enshrined within the International Bill of Human Rights. Um, and this right really is universally accepted by the Australian government, not for the, the fact, the very mere fact that they have actually ratified the international instruments, but because, and I guess regardless of what people in the audience might think, um, they have schemes in place. So such as the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, National Rent Rental Affordability Scheme and Rental Assistance Payments. Um, and given this is sort of a bit more of a Victoria base, while we do congratulate the Victorian government on their investment into the uh, $5.3 billion investment into the big housing build. And we're really looking forward to hopefully seeing some positive outcomes of that. Um, we do know that for the last decade, we have really seen unprecedented and relentless attack by the Commonwealth government on the Australian social welfare system. Um, and this is really reflected in weak or absent uh, social policy responses that really um, lead to exacerbating the crises. Um, so there's no, been no real um, new policy innovations or investments to prevent or end homelessness in more than a decade and existing strategies established by the former government, including the National Partnership on Remote Indigenous Housing have ended. And so subsequently, the lack of leadership has meant that we have not um, been able to ensure that the fundamental human right is realised and actually remains unmet for many in the community. And the numbers of people experiencing homelessness are staggering, um, given that we are such a rich country with uh, such a robust uh, social welfare system. And the 2016 census did indicate that there were 116,000 people who were classified as homeless on the particular night that the census was carried out. But I'm making the assumption that a lot of people in the audience today um, would think that that's a significant underestimation. I know from my own personal uh, work background that uh, there are so many invisible forms of homelessness. And in my experience, there were many women that were sleeping in brothels or sleeping in their cars as, as a place um, to sleep at night. And these aren't really, these, they, those sorts of spaces aren't really captured in the data collection methods that we have. 
So it'll be really interesting to see what the numbers are when the next census report comes out, I think around June this year, to see if there's any improvement or whether um, it's gotten worse, particularly in light of COVID. And I, I did read through the um, article around COVID complexities and collaboration um, with, a, with a great amount of interest. Um, over the course of a number of years, I, I became friendly with um, self-named, this is, so I haven't given him this name, but self-named homeless Kirk who slept rough around where I lived and worked in Fitzroy. Um, and as COVID sort of came on and lockdown started, um, I hadn't seen him for a while and I bumped into him and he he told me that he'd been put up in a, in a hotel in the city and that apparently it was a permanent solution. I thought that that was quite a positive outcome of COVID. But as positive as it was, um, and I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking this, um, there was a real clear frustration that these sorts of issues could be addressed when there was political will. I was also quite interested in his reflections on this and that while he said he was grateful, he also told me he felt a little bit lost. Um, he'd been taken away from his familiar surroundings and had lost some of, his, some of his identity, his community and what he felt was his comforts. And so I, I do really think that this is probably where the social work practice is so powerful. Um, the whole of person approach to working with people is so important in fostering wellbeing outcomes. Um, and this is really the vision of the association. So wellbeing and social justice for all. And to, to achieve this, it isn't as, as you know, simple as a roof over a head, but about working with that person to ensure that all the social determinants of health are met so that they can maintain the roof over their head while maintaining their health and well-being. So the authors in this edition of Parity have written about these issues, these intersecting issues um, in much greater depth and with much more subject matter expertise and probably have articulated it much better than I can or ever will be able to. Um, and I'm sure that every edition um, of Parity is full of such exceptional articles. But we are really grateful that this edition focuses on how social work and social workers can approach and address the issue of homelessness and what role social work education plays in, in teaching this. Um, the articles will no doubt assist current and future practitioners in developing knowledge and skills in the housing area. Um, and my understanding is that there's quite a lot of students that are in the audience today. And um, you know what a great way it is to immerse yourself into reading about the different facets of the homelessness sector from research, policy practice, responsiveness to specific groups of people and contemporary issues such as COVID related research. So it really is a, a very jam packed um, edition. And to this end, I think, you know, parity is such a critical platform and resource to be able to communicate um, this thought leadership in the sector. Um, and that's not just to the people in the sector, but also to the broader social community, community and welfare sectors. Um, I know it's probably a, a really simplistic statement to make, but of course it doesn't matter where you work, if you're a social worker working with a person, then their housing circumstances will be a component of the work you do with that person. And I think that's really at the core of um, social work practice. Um, so again, just wanted to acknowledge that we're really um, very humbled to be invited to launch this edition of Parity today. Um, what a great addition this is to see and to have such a focus on the social work profession and social work education in um, fostering positive change in this space. Um, the program for the launch today does look uh, quite amazing, quite sensational. No doubt there will be much thought provoking content, both from our uh, the two keynote speakers, Professor Cameron Pussell and Professor Christine Morley, but also the very interesting panel discussion topic, how can social work education and practice contribute to ending homelessness? I really hope that everyone enjoys the event today. And once again, thank you to the Council to Homeless Persons and to Parity, to, to Jenny and to Noel, who's behind the scenes doing this phenomenal work um, for including the AASW in important discussion and congratulations again on producing such an excellent edition of the Parity magazine. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Rachel. Um, thanks for um, coming along and launching this edition of Parity and here, here to, um, to, to the comments that you have made. and. Um, uh, I think um, it's the ABS figures, unfortunately, might not be out till about January next year. Um, 
and we'll see how COVID affected they are. And uh, thanks for pointing out that there are uh, students in the audience today. I just encourage them to come and work in our specialist homelessness sector. It's, it's a great, it's a great career. Um, thanks also to SSW for uh, being a co-sponsor of this edition. And um, as you intimated, Rachel, we do look forward to working even more closely um, with um, the SSW to have better educational pathways, pathways into the homelessness workforce. Really appreciate it. So my next pleasure is to introduce the first of our keynote speakers and uh, Cameron Parcell is no stranger to anyone interested in homelessness research. And uh, that is research that's changing both the way we understand homelessness and the policy and service responses that are needed. And as many of you will know, Cameron is a social worker and future fellow at the University of Queensland. His research has focused on examining the social institutions that reduce homelessness and poverty and um, <clears throat> with an aim to contribute knowledge to drive societal transformation. His most recent book with Andrew Clark and Paco Perales is uh, titled Charity and Poverty in Advanced Welfare States. So welcome Cameron and over to you. Oh, good morning, Jenny. Thank you very much for, for the introduction and thanks also for the comments, Rachel. They were, they were really engaging. I'm gonna draw on lots of those um, to follow uh, my colleagues earlier on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land on which I'm meeting, and that is the Brisbane Valley, the Turrbal and the Yagara people. Um, I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. I also, and I think Jenny may have mentioned this, I want to acknowledge very, very quickly um, Noel Murray. Noel is a phenomenal force in the Australian homelessness space, and many, many of us have had a better experience of what homelessness is and uh, helping us understand how the knowledge of homelessness is evolving over society because of Noel's continued contributions and his energy and his passion. And I really want to acknowledge that and um, appreciate everything that he's done. If there's one thing that I want to be able to convey this morning, it's that social work absolutely, absolutely needs to be at the forefront of debate and conversation and change about homelessness in Australia. Social work is profoundly well positioned. This is social work 101. Everything about social work should be directed toward transforming society so that homelessness is ended and prevented. We need to stop, stop talking about social work and social workers. We need to start thinking far more seriously and systematically about the problems that animate social work. And there are fewer more significant than homelessness, but of course, Social work needs to care. Social work is so well positioned to address homelessness because social workers, the way that they make a quid of a day, they have a phenomenal understanding of what homelessness means. We know that problems are socially produced. We know as social workers, when we go out into the field, many of the problems that we're responding to, the people that we're working with, the problems only exist because of their homelessness, or at least the problems are exacerbated because of their homelessness. Of course, we know this in the domestic violence and family violence. Well, we know that many people stay in family violence, experience trauma in the home because of housing insecurity. Of course, we also know that many people are pushed into homelessness because of violence. We similarly know that many of the child protection concerns that we respond to are either attributed to or certainly exacerbated by homelessness. We know, of course, recidivism, is driven by homelessness. We know that family functioning, the capacity of children to have a good education, the capacity of people to care for family, the capacity for people to contribute to their community is either undermined or enabled by the absence or presence of affordable housing. Social workers know this, and it's social workers who are phenomenally well-placed to be able to use this knowledge to go out and agitate for structural change. And of course, when I say use this knowledge, social work by definition is about working with and for people. It's about being guided by the expertise in people's lives. It's about not doing things for people, but being led by people's firsthand experiences, their wisdoms and their knowledges. Social work can draw on that to, in, to ensure the kind of societal change that we need, uh, we know needs to happen. We know that when people are homeless, we spend an awful lot of effort, money, and time responding to the consequences of their homelessness. We know that when people are homeless, we unnecessarily lock them up in watch houses. 
we treat them in emergency departments, we actually deal with them in courts, we have them in wards of hospitals because physicians don't want to discharge them. Social work knows that we respond to the consequences. And I think this is one of the key things that social work needs to be engaged in. How can we be just as a society when we respond to the consequences of homelessness without addressing the structural problems that contribute to homelessness? And this is a provocative question, but how can we be involved in simply mopping up the harms that homelessness produces without actually ending it? And of course, that's something of a rhetorical question because I don't think we can. I think for us to achieve the justice that's at the core of our profession and the ethics that drives us means that we need to be engaging in that radical societal change. And of course, in part, that requires that we reframe the problem. We need to reframe the problem. Homelessness is a structural and a societal problem. And I want to say something that initially sounds controversial. Homelessness is a choice. And of course, the right have said this for years. It's a choice of the deviant, deficient homeless people. Of course, that's nonsense. Homelessness is a choice of how we organise society. We choose to organise society in a way that some people are systematically disadvantaged. We know that homelessness is largely predictable among certain cohorts. We know that being an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person is profoundly predictive of being homeless. This is a choice of how we organise society and who's excluded and who's included. We also know that the experiences of childhood poverty are a strong predictor of homelessness. We know the experiences of out-of-home care. We can change these choices. We can do things differently. And there's a mounting body of evidence from Australian research in collaboration with social work practitioners that shows that what we need to do is not try and change people who are homeless. We don't need to change the individuals who are the victims of unjust systems. We actually know empirically that we need to change our housing systems. We need to change our social service systems. We need to change the structures of Australian society so that on the one hand, people can gain access to housing they're otherwise excluded from. And on the other hand, people can sustain housing in unjust systems. And of course, there's no more unjust system than the way that housing is organised in Australian society to be something that we can make an awful lot of money on. We have tax, we have policy levers that mean you can't help but make money on housing if you want to be an investor. Fabulous for the investors that are doing that. Awfully bad for people who are homeless. And of course, what we know is when we live in these inequitable societies where some people are massively benefiting from the wealth of housing in their portfolio at the expense of others, that we're all failing. Social work needs to be at the forefront of shining a light on this. And of course, we know that it is a collaboration of poverty and housing insecurity, housing unaffordability that produces homelessness. What we know from the international evidence that the so-called causes of homelessness about mental illness or even domestic and family violence or addiction are actually negated in the presence of affordable housing. They're negated in the presence of a universal and comprehensive welfare state where people have access to resources. They're negated in context where there is greater gender equity, where the penalty of experiencing violence is not also the penalty of homelessness. We know that we can do things differently. So when I talk about homelessness as a choice, I'm really putting pressure on us to reflect upon how it's a choice that we make about the policies we support and condone in the society that we have. We need to be pushing back on that. And of course, I think as mentioned by Rachel, COVID was a, a radical, almost an experiment of how things could be different. And of course, we didn't overthrow capitalism. We didn't radically change the housing market, but we demonstrated that with political will, homelessness could be ended for some people in a certain kind of a way. What's very, very important here is this idea of problematization and reframing, and this is called a social work. Homelessness was no longer seen as an issue of uh, social service systems or poverty or deviance or addiction. It was seen as a public health problem. It was actually seen as a problem that people who are homeless may spread the virus. People who are homeless may actually have um, uh, disproportionate consequences to the virus. A whole new paradigm of thinking about homelessness um, pervaded in Australia, and it was about um, how can we address this health problem? How can we address this public health emergency? And we did this through spending an awful lot of money. But of course, what we know is that when we keep people homeless, we spend an awful lot of money responding to the consequences, responding to the failures. COVID actually reminded perhaps many people on the, um, on the Zoom this morning 
what we already knew, and that was our capacity to end homelessness is not hampered by a lack of knowledge. Many, many problems in society, we can't address them because we're actually not quite sure what to do. To a very large extent, we know what we need to do in society to demonstrably reduce the number of people that are homeless now and to create the conditions that prevents those people or other people entering homelessness in the future. We don't have a knowledge gap as such. We have a problem about implementing that knowledge. I think where social work additionally is so well placed is to be able to create the conditions where that knowledge is actually used. And of course, that means working with people who are excluded by our current systems, working with people who are homeless, ensuring that their expertise, their momentum, their experiences help us shape and change policy. But social work also needs to be very, very strategically clever and sophisticated in working with people who are in business, who are in industry, who are in government, so that we can ensure that the groundswell of knowledge we have actually is able to create the type of change that we know needs to happen. We don't need to tell anyone that we need to actually reduce poverty and create more affordable housing. What we need to do now is work out how we can collectively change Australian society so that those conditions are met. And I think social work can do that with its expertise in the lives of people who are excluded, but also with social work expertise on the systems that produce homelessness and about working with um, stakeholders to bring about that societal type of change that we need. I think at its core, social work needs to be absolutely a forefront of advocating for the type of change that we need so that we're not responding to the consequences and soothing the consequences of homelessness, but rather transforming Australian society so that it's ended. I might leave it there, Jenny. I know that there are many other people to speak and I'm, I'm ex extraordinarily keen to hear the panel in about half an hour. Um, so I'll hand it over to you now. Uh, thanks, Cameron. That's brilliant. And uh, thanks so much for anchoring this morning's discussion in the structural nature of uh, homelessness. And uh, I hope you'll allow me to borrow that uh, turn of phrase that uh, homelessness is a choice, the choice of society. Um, yeah, thank you. That's all yours, Dan. <clears throat> and thanks so much for uh, supporting us this morning as you so frequently do um, with these events. Really appreciate it. Our um, second keynote speaker is Professor Christine Morley. Uh, Christine is the Professor and Head of Social Work and Human Services Discipline in the School of Public Health and Social Work at the Queensland University of Technology. Uh, Christine's passionate advocate of critical social work and has published extensively on its application to social work education and practice. So thanks for being with, with us this morning, Christine, and over to you. I know Christine's there. Here we go. Can you hear me now? The seance thing again. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you too for the opportunity to be part of this important launch. I too uh, would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded Gubby Gubby lands that I'm speaking from this morning. Um, and I'd like to add my congratulations to Noel and everyone else who's involved uh, in this important um, launch in addition. I also just wanna take a moment to thank um, everyone involved for the important work that they're doing to end homelessness, particularly those of you who are at the front line. I know that this work is hard, it's emotionally exhausting, it's often undervalued and underappreciated and yet it's so vital. So I just really want to acknowledge and, and thank you for the work that you're doing. So I really enjoyed um, your presentation, Chris, and um, thank you for that. And uh, you know, thinking about critical social work. Um, absolutely, we need to be advocates. Absolutely, we need to be um, pointing out uh, the structural problems um, that exist around homelessness and, and to change them at a structural level. And I think um, I, I've only had a, an opportunity to have a quick look at um, the special edition 
but what an important initiative this is um, around homelessness, particularly given the mess that we're in currently in Australia with profound and widening inequalities, uh, which continue to, um, you know, continue to grow, I think. And, you know, we can see that with the current housing crisis in Australia, no real plans to address it at a national level. So again, we've recently had the unveiling of another federal budget that has yet again failed to provide any measures um, that address the lack of access to affordable housing or the more urgent need for social housing. Um, and instead, we seem to be introducing more policy schemes to continue to drive housing affording, affordability, um, which continues, continues to be a problem. With the nation's rental vacancy now falling to a record low uh, of 1% in March, in all capitals other than Sydney and Melbourne, which posted vacancy rates below 1%, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison says that the way that we can help renters is to help them buy a house. But 30% of low income people in private rental markets don't even have $500 savings to be you know, let alone, you know, for emergencies, let alone to be able to put that aside for a, for a housing deposit, which, which would actually be significant given that the cost of housing has skyrocketed in recent years with the median price of an average home now costing more than around $700,000. So Liberal governments at the federal level have used policy systematically to embed poverty and housing equality in the fabric of Australian society. My, I take this opportunity to, to talk about my um, colleagues work Jenny Mays at, at QUT who's undertaken research to show how the Howard Liberal National Coalition from 1996 to 2007 and the more, more recent Abbott and Morrison Liberal National Coalition governments from 2013 to now have methodically entrenched homelessness as a major social problem by essentially transforming housing, something that was once considered a basic human right and public good into an asset for wealth generation. So this erodes a logic of social justice and replaces it with the neoliberal view that a good society is a market society. And policies that promote negative gearing, the commodification of housing, the politicisation of housing policy, the deregulation of the housing market, all demonstrate how disadvantaged groups are systematically excluded from accessing affordable housing in order to benefit the wealth creation efforts of the rich. And just to add insult to injury, neoliberal thinking also, you know, institutes this publicly shared logic that blames victims for the inequality and exclusion that they experience, which is used to justify measures that erode access to affordable housing for many disadvantaged populations. So we know, for example, that specialist homelessness services in Australia were more, uh, respond to more than 278,000 clients a year. We know that on a daily basis, more than 300 individuals and families seeking assistance are unable to be assisted because of chronic accommodation shortages. We know that the top three reasons for people presenting to homelessness agencies in Queensland include financial difficulties, housing crisis um, and housing affordability stress. We know that the people presenting at homelessness services in Queensland are reporting these reasons at, at higher rates um, than in other states and territories in Australia. So as Jenny mentioned back in 2016 on census night, more than 116,000 people were homeless across Australia. We know that that situation is getting worse both nationally and in Queensland as we are seeing big increases in people seeking assistance from homeless services, many for the first time in their lives. So if we've got all these new clients, it must mean that things are worse and we await that data. We know, uh, as Chris mentioned, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to be overrepresented as clients in homelessness services. Um, and we know that the national, you know, on the national basis, 39%, or almost two in five people that present to homelessness services identify domestic and family violence as the reason for their homelessness. Recent research um, undertaken by Kelly Moss and Heather Fraser and Shane Warren and Adam Barnes suggests that affordable housing is the defining social issue of our time. And all of these researches spell out the connections between homelessness and domestic violence. Moss and Heather found that homeless women that they interviewed, for example, recognised the injustice of their experiences. But as we know, with, with neoliberalism that in, introduces that victim blaming, most also reflected on their internalised sense of fear as a result of, of 
failure and as a result became increasingly isolated. We know that homelessness impacts every aspect of people's lives and well-being. We know that rates of domestic violence and homelessness have increased exponentially and that lockdowns um, associated with the COVID pandemic um, have exacerbated that problem too. We also know in the context of climate change, while we see increasing extreme weather, that um, you know, these uh, populations who are most disadvantaged are again most uh, impacted by the inequalities um, of these broader social changes with uh, more vulnerable populations um, becoming more likely to become climate refugees in areas because they live in areas that are potentially more prone to flooding and drought and therefore are more susceptible to the consequences of extreme weather events. We've recently seen the devastating impacts of this, particularly in South East Queensland, in Lismore, and in New South Wales, Northern rivers, where families displaced by the floods are now being forced out of temporary accommodation to make way for holiday makers during the Easter break. So the injustices of this are profound. Andy Nygaard's research is instructive because it suggests a lack of affordable housing isn't just harming the people who can't buy or rent homes, which is enough to, to take action in itself, but it also harms society as a whole. Insufficient investment in housing uh, now costs over $676 million a year, which modelling suggests will go up to $1.3 by 2036 if nothing is done. And being closely connected with so many other social problems, as Chris was talking about, um, rising homelessness not only has implications for increasing the strain on the homelessness sector, but police, hospitals, mental health services, child protection services, domestic violence services, and many other public health and um, social services as well. So to redress the injustices of the housing crisis, I agree with Mays, who suggests that we need a new politics of redistributive justice. Uh, the introduction of a basic universal income that provides a safety net for people, progressive taxation reform and a strengthened welfare state as a move to more, towards a more socially just and democratic world. I also support War Warren and Barnes' proposal to implement supportive housing that facilitates assisted, non-conditional, flexi flexible access to tenancy to support uh, at-risk families more effectively. Finally, in a sector dominated by neoliberalism and as a, a head of a, a social work and human services discipline, I support critical forms of social work because they seek to reinvigorate social work as an emancipatory project um, and activate students to be citizen activists. Um, much has been positive said about, about the ASW and, and of social work and, and we appreciate that, but social work is also caught in the neoliberal web and can become part of the problem if we don't remain critical. So, you know, the emphasis on a, on a structural and political analysis of society, the emphasis on critical self-reflection to, to reflect on our own privilege and how we might be able to, um, you know, make changes that, that make a difference. Um, to take effective action for social justice, justice really need to be at the forefront of everything that social workers are doing. In the context of homelessness, this means really advocating for people who are experiencing homelessness and mobilising practices of critique and resistance to push for progressive social change. So thank you. So thanks so much, uh, Christine, uh, for I think uh, elaborating on our national structural problem and uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll um, probably borrow entrenched market thinking and think about how I can make uh, new politics of redistrib dis redistributive justice a little bit more media friendly if I possibly can. But uh, thank you so much uh, for being our second keynote speaker today. And, and thanks to you and to your colleagues at uh, QUT for your in heavy involvement in the development and preparation of uh, this edition. And thanks again to both of our keynote uh, speakers. So I, I'm with uh, Cameron, I'm very excited about the discussion uh, panel uh, to come. And the, the panel members have been given the extremely easy task of providing straightforward answers to the simple question, how can social work education and practice contribute to ending homelessness? 
piece of pie. I'm not sure why we'd even discuss that. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be stepping to one side and handing over to my colleague, Robin Martin, the Associate Dean for Social Work and Human Services at RMIT University, who has very kindly agreed to moderate this tricky question. Um, but before I hand over to Robin, I'm going to introduce her and, and the panel members. So you know a little bit more about where the panel members are coming from. So uh, Robin uh, commenced social work practice in a women's homelessness service in 1987. And since that time, she's been involved in the homelessness area. And that includes her 2012 PhD on women's pathways into and out of homelessness. And she's committing, she is very committed to centering uh, and valuing lived experience and expertise. Um, Phil Crane is the Adjunct Associate Professor of Social Work and Human Services uh, at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And uh, Phil's been a long-term friend of uh, CHP and Parity and been involved in researching and supporting early intervention into homelessness practice for a 30 year period, particularly in relation to youth homelessness and transition from care. We have Juliet Watson, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Global Urban and Social Studies at RMIT University. And, Vice President of the Australian Women's and Gender Studies Association. Uh, Juliet's a social worker and sociologist and was previously the Deputy Director of the Unison Housing Research Lab, where she designed and coordinated the social work undergraduate course on homelessness. We also have with us Shane Warren, who's a lecturer in the School of Public Health and Social Work uh, in the Faculty of Health at QUT. And Shane's practiced social work for more than 25 years, including in uh, disability services, family support, child protection, youth justice, and housing and homelessness. And Shane's passionate about critical approaches to social work education and practice. We also have with us Chris Horsell, who's currently a lecturer in social work at the University of South Australia. And Chris has written uh, several articles in Australian social work and international social work on homelessness and disability, uh, as well as several book chapters on homelessness policy and he's got extensive experience as a social worker in the areas of homelessness, disability uh, policy and problem gambling. Uh, my colleague, Robin Miller, is the CEO of McKillop Family Services. Robin is a social worker and family therapist with uh, more than 30 years experience in the community sector, government and child protection. She was a senior clinician and teacher for 14 years at Bouvery and uh, from 20 and also provided professional leadership as a chief practitioner within our DH, well, Department of Human Services in Victoria, and also worked as a consultant on the Royal Commission inst into Institutional Responses on Child Sexual Abuse. And finally, Darren Stonehouse is a lecturer in social work and community welfare at Southern Cross Uni. His research examines political material and lived experience dimensions of homelessness and housing insecurity in our country. Uh, and prior to moving full-time academia, he practices as a social worker in the homelessness and social housing sectors in both New South Wales and Victoria. So, wow, what a panel. And over to you, Robin. Great. Thanks, Jenny. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, Rachel, Cameron and um, Christine, I think, for really setting the scene for what I think is going to be a pretty powerful and uh, wide reaching conversation. And as Jenny says, we've got this really easy question to kind of frame our discussions of how can social work education and practice <coughs> contribute to ending homelessness? Before I open up to the panel for their first responses to this very big question, I kind of want to foreground it. I think Rachel, Cameron and Christine really located the discussion for us. Rachel's point and Cameron kind of, you know, explained it in a slightly different way, but it doesn't matter where we work as social workers. We will always meet, engage with and be asked to journey alongside people who are experiencing homelessness. It is core, it is central to our practice. I guess as an educator, I've always been curious about how central and core is it to the education for social work students. Um, so I open up to the panel and just say, what are your first responses to the big question? Um, well, I'll have a go. <clears throat> um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, that I'm speaking on the lands of the Ghana people and uh, 
pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, so I'm speaking from uh, the Adelaide Plains area. Um, I guess my initial response to that question is that um, I'm very much a kind of, uh, people would say a policy head. I think it's an unfavourable term. I think um, as the... Uh, as, as a social worker, um, we, are, we are obliged to think about policy and practices, a nexus, an intimate nexus. And my frame is very much that policy frameworks uh, provide the context within which practice takes place. Um, so I think part of addressing the issue of educating around social workers regarding issues to do with homelessness, and if we could, uh, if we could talk about ending homelessness, um, I think it's very much around providing uh, students with a critical tools of critical analysis in regard to contemporary policy frameworks around homelessness. I think that is very much around contextualizing um, homeless responses as reflective of what essentially are residualist responses to uh, policy frameworks. That's been historically the case, and I think it continues to do so. Um, certainly in South Australia, uh, in, at uh, University of South Australia. Um, I've worked with some excellent colleagues uh, and in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Dr. Carol Zufre, uh, Dr. Shenz Lanzioni uh, in particular, and also Dr. Michelle Jalden, um, where we do specifically look at policy context within which homelessness occurs. And we use a number of approaches which deconstruct um, essentially what are often seen to be individualizing discourses um, and I think that's in part, from my point of view, um, a, a critical part of actually allowing students to see that problems are framed as camera noted in particular ways. And the more we can do to actually uh, deconstruct and provide a critical framework around that, the better. Thanks, Chris. It's a really important reminder about where we start our analysis in terms of and I think Cameron invited us and challenged us around that. Are we talking about a problems located in an individual or it's located in uh, policies and systems? And I guess I'd add they're systems that are doing what they were designed to do, actually. Okay, any other panel members who'd like to respond either to Chris or the broader question? I, mean, I might just jump in and say yes, <laughs> co-sign on everything <laughs> that's been said. Um, I'll just note that I'm on uh, the lands of the Wurundjeri people uh, here in Melbourne. Um, and also just to, you know, build on what our keynote speakers so eloquently put forward to us, you know, what we need to remember. What I mean, what they spoke about in that broader sphere is actually the foundation of what, I uh, guess, a social work education of homelessness needs to be um, and particularly as Chris was talking about that critical lens that is needed now more than ever it seems to me <laughs> I mean it's not gosh you know if ever there was a critical lens needed across so many aspects of society it's now but particularly with homelessness where we're, you know, numbers are increasing it's not getting better um, you know and in many ways homelessness isn't that complicated <laughs> uh, in terms of how, you know, systems seem to make it more complicated than it, it needs to be. Um, but I guess the other thing I wanted to touch on in terms of education, and I know, Robin, you have a, and other people on the panel are very passionate about lived experience, and that is not... You know, I think there's a tendency when you're perhaps looking at it from outside that homelessness is this kind of amorphous experience or a generic experience. And... You know, if, we, if we're looking at lived experience, then we actually see that, yes, there is absolutely shared experience going on with homelessness, but we miss a lot if we're not actually looking at lived experience and how that can differ. You know, that if we're talking about a critical lens, that means that intersectionality is absolutely critical to this. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the work that Carol Zufere has done in this space as being absolutely vital to how we understand homelessness from a critical lens and an intersectional lens. Thanks, Juliet. Robin, did I get a sense that you might like to say something? Oh, thanks, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> the Robin side. It is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm on Boonarong land and uh, pay my respects to um, elders past, present and to the children. Um, I, I have loved the discussion and the speakers, so thank you for the richness um, that I've heard already. Uh, but, you know, when we think about the structural um, dynamics 
and what society chooses, picking up Cameron's point. Um, if you think about the biggest group of homeless people are actually children, and you think about the links between out-of-home care and growing up in care, uh, we know in Victoria that um, research has shown that almost two-thirds of young people experiencing homelessness um, have spent time in out-of-home care. And half the young people leaving residential care today in Victoria are likely to be homeless within three years. How do we put up with that as a society? I think that's one of the greatest, most outrageous, um, shameful facts um, that you could speak out loud about, you know? Um, so how does that social work education and that critical reflection uh, on, on the way resources are, are used, both in how we, number one, prevent children coming into out-of-home care and therefore prevent homelessness, yeah, get in early. You ask any maternal and child health nurse, any kindergarten, they are very clearly in aware usually of the most at-risk families. How do we have a family-centred approach? How do we shift the dial in the child protection funding and the enormously expensive residential care funding? So if you look critically at the way resources are spent, there is, um, it's, it's the triangles inverted. You know, most of the money is going to the very pointy end residential care of kids. And I, I put in the article in parity that, that, you know, we've done some analysis of um, the young people and we, we are doing very deep dive case reviews of their history and, and their journey and asking the kids themselves. The two greatest worries the kids will tell us are what's going to happen when I leave care and, and what about my family? So when we look at the stats and we've done these deep dive reviews, we call them Outcomes 100 because we, we had 100 children in, in residential care in Victoria and a killer. But 36% of the young people had, ten, had experienced 10 or more placements. 13% had had 20 or more placements. And 6% had had 30 or more placements. And two had had um, 56 placements. So I've done reviews on all of these kids. You know, the system is structured poorly to actually meet the needs of these kids and um, their therapeutic needs in care. So it's, we've got to look holistically at that part of the system, but equally don't divert, invest more in the prevention end to work with families earlier. Um, and in social work education terms, I think, you know, we love having students here at MacKillop. And what we're trying to do is break down those three silos, you know, policy, practice and research. And we need to all be critical thinkers and know how to integrate across. So that's my parting comment around social work education. Yeah, that's great, Robin. Thank you. I, I am going to open up to the panel, but because I think there'll be a couple of people who want to respond, but I just want to reiterate what you've said. A project I finished recently was about the experience of leaving care and homelessness, both in WA and Victoria. Same stats, you know, of 1,800 young people in the four year period post leaving care, more than 50% had access to homelessness services, some of them more than 10 times. And I, just to reiterate, you know, one of the biggest issues for those young people was a lack of planning to get to get ready to leave care and absolutely no safety nets in terms of, so what we might expect of young people who have not had a care experience, they're remaining at home longer, there are supports and safety nets around those young people, whereas this is clearly a group who doesn't. So we see them kind of coming through homelessness services a lot and social work services. And thank you for the challenge about trying to break down the silos uh, for education. Uh, panel members, responses, mm. Shane. Yes. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, Shane Warren here. I'm in uh, Mianjin, uh, Brisbane, and um, I'm on Yagara and Turrbal uh, country. And I'd also like to um, extend um, and recognise uh, the traditional owners and, and elders um, in uh, the area that I'm coming to you from and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, this has just been a, an incredible conversation and I've had so many um, uh, just uh, wonderful insights uh, coming to me as I've been hearing people talking. And I just wanted to, to start by saying uh, social work does make a really important contribution uh, to, to ending um, social work, uh, ending homelessness. Uh, and uh, our focus has been 
uh, through thinking about and conceptualising social work in critical ways, both in education and in practice. And it does feel like, you know, uh, with what all of the speakers have said so far, we're at a critical moment um, in Australia. Um, you know, we can go down one path as a country um, uh, where we continue to see these uh, rising inequalities, or we can uh, choose, as Cameron has said, uh, to do something about it as a nation. Um, and I think social work has a, a role to play in uh, that advocacy and activism that's needed. And I'm particularly interested in uh, how social workers are using critical reflection and also resistances in their practices uh, to uh, you know, deal with and address some of the challenges uh, of neoliberalism. Look, it wasn't that too long ago in Queensland that I can remember um, you know, uh, successive uh, you know, policy arrangements where we had very, specialist homelessness services having very short-term funding agreements you know, agreements that were only six months, 12 months, 18 months, um, lots of uncertainty across the homelessness and housing sectors. And that went on for a number of years. And, you know, I'm mindful the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement expires sort of in the middle of next year. And, you know, very um, anxious and worried that, you know, we don't see a, a repeat of those, you know, of those, um, of those times. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the coming federal election um, is really is really critical. Uh, I'd also just like to emphasise uh, that one of the key words in this question for me is around contribution, because I think social workers do make a really important contribution, but we can't do it on our own. You know, we need the political leadership. Uh, we need every level of government engaging uh, around this issue. Uh, social workers are so well placed and skilled at working with um, partners uh, across all areas of industry. Um, and I think uh, those uh, networks uh, are extremely important uh, in, in relation to this challenge of, of ending homelessness. Uh, and I'd just like to say, I think uh, when I reflect on the last couple of years, there's been some, some real opportunities around um, building uh, closer connections to specialist homelessness services. And uh, I noticed uh, when I was reading through the Parity uh, magazine, a number of authors sort of commenting on the need for homelessness to have a much stronger profile in social work education and curriculum. And I'd also agree with that and very committed to that. And um, I guess one of the things that we've been very interested in doing is you know, partnering with um, specialist homelessness services in all the different areas, doing um, you know, uh, placements around direct practice, uh, you know, research and policy focused uh, placements, community development um, uh, focused placements as well, and recognising the great diversity um, of, uh, of the homelessness and housing sectors. So um, that's something that we're very keen to, to continue. That sounds great, Shane. Thank you. I think it might lead into some future conversations. Um, Philip. Uh, thank you very much. Um, look, uh, I guess um, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge um, I'm on uh, Turrbal and Yagra country and acknowledge um, the traditional owners here. The, um, I guess what I'd like to, to suggest is that there's, part, there's parts of this that are, seem apparently clear, certainly to the sort of a community of, of uh, people that we have here today. And that is around the essential need to have uh, uh, analysis and thinking and responses which don't forget the, and, and, and have clear strategies around structural and systemic and institutional level issues. I think that's relatively, um, to some extent, not contentious, uh, although it may be contentious to many others. Um, um, <clears throat> that said, I think to me, the real interesting complexities are about a range of other things. Um, and uh, they have to do with, um, for example, and I, I hear I think that the addition uh, today's edition has done a really good job at, at pointing to what some of these areas are. Um, there's, there, there is this, this interesting intersection between um, notions of housing and housing insufficiency, lack of affordability, et cetera, and more subjective experienced notions of home and what it is 
uh, people need from where they live to be able to have lives of well-being. And of course, that becomes into clear focus when we're dealing with people who don't have a socially um, uh, authorised way to have their own housing. And young people are clearly in that position where questions of the intersection between housing and home become an arena for exploration. Um, how do we how do we deal with that when there isn't social sanctioning for people to have such access? Um, anyway, so the other thing I think that is interesting is in how we conceptualise social work. And to me, it seems as though people, we often talk uh, about social work from diff slightly different positionalities without necessarily us being explicit um, entirely about what those include and then what those don't include. So we have social work as a profession, which will utilize language around social workers. And those are people who are individually accredited to call themselves social workers. And, and obviously a peak body and the institutional arrangements that go with a profession. Um, we also have the notion of education and the social work education is somewhat broader and includes a broader suite of people than simply social workers. I am one. Um, and we also then have the notion of social work as a set of values. And we hear that strongly informing critical social work perspectives, for example. And then I think the bit that really interests me is how do we actually engage with a phenomena that goes well beyond social work, which goes to the social and economic world that we live in, and how do we understand our role within that. And it seems to me the other contribution from social work that's that's the one that seems to have that capacity to be intersectional is the one around its, its framework around ecological, uh, contextualized, value underpinned um, worlds and practice. And and that is that framework that it brings, which is some, I think, distinctive amongst the different um, disciplinary areas. And it's that capacity to more holistically look at, at and bridge between the world of home and the experienced world and the uh, policy world and the world of how we distribute resources that, that I think is the, is the ground that we can engage in fruitfully from this disciplinary perspective, from this perspective. And I would I, I, there's just a couple of concepts in that were in the journal that I, the things that, that particularly, um, I particularly enjoyed. I really enjoyed uh, Chris uh, Horrell's um, notion of linking a theory of recognition to what many of us would think of as in terms of the importance of the voice and influence of those who are affected by and impacted on by homelessness, who quite frankly are not often in the conversations. And the Council to Homeless Persons I think is somewhat um, uh, to be applauded for being on the front foot around that particular nexus. I'm not sure we do very well at universities, by the way. Um, and uh, another one I really thought of uh, or, or, or seemed uh, really useful to me was the way that um, uh, Cameron unpacked um, the link between structure and agency. And I think what we see playing out is often it's pitched as a battle that if somehow you don't, you were involved in listening to the voice of people and you're down there in agencies and whatever, that you aren't interested or cognizant of broader contextual issues. Indeed, when early intervention in youth homelessness was being promoted, ironically, by a conservative government in the mid to late 1990s, there was significant op opposition from the youth housing sector at that time, seeing this as, as undermining the social justice and, 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 and pursuit of the right of housing agenda. Um, since that time, people now have come to acknowledge that just because you intervene early doesn't mean you're intervening badly. Um, that in fact, this is all important and the temporal frame of how do we match from prevention right through to critical responses when people are, 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 are experiencing rough sleeping are all important. 
Um, so how do we assist students to do that? And I guess one of the things I think social work education can do is to be aware of its own capacity to um, uh, create students who may have a narrower rather than a broader and more holistic mindset, who are less well equipped to look at the enabling possibilities within agencies and systems, but tend to only see or first and most prominently see the deficits, the deficiencies, the whatever, which absolutely not saying those aren't there, but but to actually play a positive role in that, students need to be able to also be strategic, as people have said, opportunistic, read the environment, be able to act purposefully and ethically mindfully in those environments. So I think there's a complex and a sophisticated set of skills, to use one of Cameron's phrases, and I think... Um, uh, I think there's a range of positionalities people bring to this, and I think that that has to include a much stronger involvement of people's own frames of where they're at in their lives when they experience difficulty, and that, and that we are well positioned within a social work frame to acknowledge and engage with that and promote that and advocate for that. Mm, thanks, Philip. Lots of rich provocations there. Thank you. Something that comes to mind as you were speaking as well, and I've become extremely aware of, particularly during COVID, is the lived experience of homelessness of many social work students and housing precarity as well. So I want to kind of put that into the mix and we might return to that. Darren, I'm wondering if you might like to uh, contribute I don't know where you're going to start. There's so much richness, but I'll leave it to you. Yeah, um, thank you, Robin. I, I feel like um, you know the student that goes last in the classroom and says, "Well, everybody's already said what I wanted to say." So, um, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge the peoples of the Yugamba uh, language region that I'm on today and pay my respects. And I certainly agree with um, pretty much everything that's um, been said before by my fellow panelists. And I, I think probably. Maybe the one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet in terms of maybe broadening uh, that question around the role of social workers in education, I think is uh, maybe a bit of an untapped uh, area is around our, our role in participating in, and sort of really driving community education and engaging uh, beyond you know, uh, the homelessness sector and beyond those with immediate lived experiences to really you know, start those conversations. Because I think what we're seeing in the uh, you know, those conversations with the wider community and the wider public. You know, I think a lot of what we're seeing, um, you know, in the in the mainstream media at the moment, I think is a is a moment in which people's awareness of how housing insecurity is affecting a much wider proportion of the population is is an example of a really um, you know important opportunity for us to uh, be be giving voice to that and to drawing connections um, from. Yes, our teaching, our research, our partnerships with, with industry, our, our engagement with those with lived experience, but bringing that into the attention of the wider public and having those conversations, because I think, you know, as, as many people have mentioned, we don't lack knowledge uh, and we don't, we haven't lacked uh, attempts to convey that knowledge to decision makers. It's the lack of political will to act on that knowledge. And I think until we get that that real drive from within the community in a, in a broader sense, you know, to make it a, a, a policy issue, to make it a, a, a political issue, an election issue, um, you know, I think that's where we can start to see some real change. So, you know, I think, um, you know, social work has a lot to offer then in terms of um, contributing to that public conversation and that public education within communities. Right, thanks, Darren. That's excellent. So I think, you know, as a panel and the, um, the keynotes have really um, consolidated that, you know, homelessness is core business for social workers. I want to raise a question for the educators, particularly on the panel, but um, Robin, I think you've already kind of kicked this conversation off a bit as well is, but how well are we doing in terms of curriculum? How much do we embed, how well do we embed either knowledge about housing and homelessness, practice skills in responding to people who experience homelessness, 
And my final part of the question is how well do we bring lived experience and lived expertise of homelessness into our teaching? I might jump in there. And actually that follows on very nicely from what Darren was just talking about because I was taking notes as he was speaking and I was thinking social work, you know, kind of lives and dies according to the strength of its partnerships <laughs> with, you know, all our organisations. And I think uh, you know, in addition to what Darren was talking about, what can we kind of, you know, bring with the knowledge we have uh, also, what is that knowledge that we're getting back? Because this is very much a reciprocal relationship if it's working properly. Um, and I know from the course that I run, the, the input of CHP from Unison Housing, from Launch Housing, from different services that are out there, the Salvation Army, has been essential to actually kind of having a course that's credible um, you know, I think there's, you need that credibility with the course that you're running and you can't just kind of go in there and say this is how it is. You need that, that collaboration with the sector going on there. And it's an ongoing collaboration too. I don't think it's you set up the course and here you go. Things change and we need to know what the, you know, what are the challenges facing the sector? What's going on really well in the sector? Um, and, you know, it's not just about in the classroom, it's, you know, I think if we have opportunities for students to engage with different services through the education they're receiving and just getting that perspective from the services, that really creates a, a much richer experience, even if the students then don't go on to work in homelessness. I mean, as Robin said at the beginning, it, it underpins everything anyway. <laughs> Housing security, it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, working in disability or aged care or whichever discipline. Housing security is going to be part of that. Um, and on a final point, I think the, the, the area of lived experience is really interesting and in terms of how you embed that in the courses because there is the possibility that that can become exploitative. You know, you, you, the students, I think, really value that. And that's the feedback I get from students is they love hearing from people because it really challenges their ideas about what homelessness looks like. But a question is, how do we do that without just kind of exploiting people to come in and tell their stories there? Um, one answer to that, and this is a big shout out to CHP, is their PEST program, which we certainly make the most of. And CHP does an incredible job there of, you know, working with people with lived experience to be able to come and talk about that that in a in a really productive way we hear people's stories but there's you know the the, the pest representatives absolutely bring a broader view to what's happening so I, I i found that a really useful way of bringing lived experience into the classroom thanks juliet i think you know part of what i take from your points is to avoid what the late disability activist Stella Young called inspiration porn, mm. which is we have people with lived experience come into our teaching learning spaces mm. and students, you know, I think as educators, we don't carefully set it up as well. And then it becomes this kind of idea of that's amazing, but has it transformed who I am as a social worker and a person in the world? So good reminders. Other panellists who might like to respond to this question that I've posed, how well are we doing uh, in our education and our curricula? I think Darren's got his hand up, Robin. <laughs> oh, Darren. I might be, a, I might be off screen. Um, yeah, I, I would like to respond to that just um, briefly. And I think just picking up particularly um, on um, you know, what Julia was just saying then, I think, uh, and certainly one of the things I, I really learned through um, research that I've been doing recently around lived experience is, you know, people with lived experience don't just have a story to tell about their own experience of what it's like to be homeless, but also what needs to change in order to address homelessness. And I think that that contribution is often missing. Um, and, and, and as Julie said, uh, kind of risks getting overridden by the, yeah, the focus on their story. Um, and, and I think you know we have much more to learn than just than just that of course that's critical and important as well but there are other things that, that many homeless people want to say uh, about you know how we respond to homelessness politically through service systems through social work practice as well uh, and i think that in terms of the question of how well we're doing i think i, I think we're doing um 
I think we're doing quite well. And, and I think obviously the addition really highlights the, um, the different ways, but also many of the synergies between how the different institutions are uh, trying to uh, incorporate a focus on homelessness. And of course, you know, the, I think there's always that tension or that question around, um, you know, finding space within curriculum for whether it's a standalone subject or unit on homelessness or whether it's best to embed it in different ways through other units on policy or on practice. Um, you know, so I think there's always room to incorporate it more. And I think um, it's, it's also about us making that argument for it being a really core area of, of social work and, and something that needs and deserves a, a much more prominent presence within, within curriculum. Hey, Darren, thank you. Um, Robin or Chris, were you wanting to say something? Yeah, I just, um, I can, yeah, just fully reiterate what has been said so far, but um, in terms of lived experience and so forth, one of the ways that I guess, um, like we've been able to do it here at UniSA in particular is, um, I think the use of case studies, and I don't like the term per se, but the use of case studies, which provide exemplars of um, the connection between people's lived experience and the structural context within which they experience homelessness, provide a really, um, I guess, grounded understanding for students around, um, around what it's like to experience homelessness and, and kind of the broader causal issues around that. Um, I use one in particular that um, was part of my practice experience and has resonated with me for, tw for 20 years, where in fact a, a guy who's about in his mid thirties, and I dig, dig go into it a great deal, but essentially this guy in his mid thirties rocked up to a place where I worked. Um, uh, and because of it, it, it because of, obviously systemic failures and the fact that there were silo mentalities around things like mental health, disability, um, drug and alcohol, et cetera, services, failing to provide a service for this bloke, um, he died on the streets. Um, and that particular telling of that story, um, people, students, almost their jaws drop because they don't understand that people die from the experience of homelessness. So I think and without sort of making that into some sort of voyeuristic exercise, I think the telling of those stories in whatever shape or form they look like really drive home the point um, that I think has been, you know, a, a theme in this whole discussion. And that is that the personal is political, that people's experience is a function, as Cameron pointed out, of policy choices, et cetera, that governments make. And I think until we actually kind of, that, I think that point really needs to be driven home. Um, I, and I think it's a magnificent point, is that we choose as a society as to who is poor, who is homeless, who, um, yeah, who experiences disadvantage. They're active choices. And until we address that um, and educate students about that politics, then I think we're going to be kind of struggling, if you like, to quote, end homelessness. Great, right, thanks, Chris. Robin, was there something you wanted to add to this conversation? I think, um, Robin, perhaps that focus on the fieldwork education and, and engaging social work students in opportunities to really feel their own potency in engagement skills so that the personal is political, as Chris just said. So, so you know, and it's, it's about that integrative approach where you, you're able to think at the macro level and that systemic with that critical reflection happening. Uh, but but that you gain this, the confidence and skills that people that we that we are able to connect, you know, and think systemically, not just about this young person, or, but their family. Yeah. So there is something that's unique about social work in that we have as a profession, and we need to train to have those um, that very integrated model that is different from psychology and other therapeutic sort of training. Yeah. Mm. yeah great. Thanks, Robin. Um, I'm kind of conscious of time and we're probably starting to move towards uh, winding up the panel conversation. So I'd just like to open it up to the panel. I've directed the conversation a little bit, but are there some kind of other points, thoughts, reflections that you would like to share as we start to close, as close this panel discussion? Um, Phil here. 
I mean, one of the things I'd like to do is just um, reflect a little bit about what Robin said in her opinion piece in the, in the edition, um, where she talked about the importance of evidence. And in some other parts, the notion of evidence is, is seen as somewhat a neoliberal construct as, as somehow constraining how we think about real issues and reducing practice to the production of evidence. Um, and I do think um, it's worthwhile, particularly for those of us who are educators as well, and thinking about what we think constitutes evidence, that the problem isn't having evidence, the, the problem is ha ha what we consider evidence to be and, and is evidence, evidence that comes from lived experience as well as from, you know, refereed articles and, and, and um, uh, uh, peer-reviewed research. Um, wh what do we understand knowledge and evidence about practice and where do we get it from? And I think in, 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 the, in the social work space, there's a very important... Um, uh, requirement to draw on a range of forms of evidence and a range of voices in who produce that evidence and that that's part of what we ought to be um, uh, sharing and assisting students to to grapple with is how do they be well informed in their practice um, uh, without being captive to particular narrow notions of what constitutes evidence. If I, can, if I can jump in there, and just because I'm passionate about this, and when you're trying to influence a minister and get funding or treasury and finance, you have to have the emotive case study, the scenario yes, that sir. will capture and yes, illustrate sir. in yes, layman's sir. language down to earth what is really going on for this family, yeah, or this child or this young person. But equally, you need to have the smarts around the research. And we need to discipline students to be able to think and understand the importance of evidence and to put time into, um, you know, one of the important things I reckon around leadership is actually privileging the importance of evaluation and research in, in a very busy programmatic direct service role. We can do that practice-led evidence, you know, and evidence-led practice. And it is that intersectionality uh, around the, um, policy development that comes ground up. Practice is always ahead of policy. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, and research is often catching up with what's best practice. But how do you scale up good practice? You mm -hmm. need to have enough persuasive argument and quite rightly accountability around having some demonstrated knowledge around it does work. Not that we're just pumping up our ties with an emotive scenario and an emotive case example. You know. Yep. So, I, I am passionate about that. And having independent evaluation has made a real difference at McKillop, where we've been able to write tenders with integrity around saying, this is what we did, yes. this is why it worked, these are the outcomes. So impact-based um, you know, work. Yes. And, and so I think you know, social work education, really, it's like, have, have a, um, I think you know, it, it's a strong leadership role within social work education to, uh, to not become, to not dichotomise, you know, to, mm. to actually um, see, understand how the real world works down at DTF, federally and state funding, where, and most of our programs are dependent on that, mm. uh, that you've, you've got to be able to um, systematically uh, influence. Yes. Thanks for raising it. I thought it was a good point you made. Yeah, Robin, I think, and Phil, it sort of reminds me of those ideas about evidence-based practice and evidence for practice, and they both have a part, and I think you're giving us some really concrete examples of that, Robin. Uh, panel members, any final comments before I hand back to Jenny? Looking like possibly not. Um, okay, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. It's been a great conversation. I feel like we could probably go on for a lot longer, but we will, in the interest of time, start to wind it up there. Uh, Jenny, I'd like to hand back to you, but I also want to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Woiwurrung people um, of the Eastern Kulin Nations and pay my respects to Elders past and present and recognise these are unceded lands. Thanks, Jenny. Oh, look, thanks, Robin, and uh, thanks for uh, facilitating that so beautifully. Um, uh, and thanks to uh, the panellists for a, a great discussion. And uh, I'll take away uh, the absence of a social sanction for people to have a home. And I'll take away the breakdown of silos 
uh, needing to break down the silos between policy, practice and research. And no one will be shocked uh, to know that I'm uh, heavily holding down the end of the seesaw on um, looking for a much pointier focus on um, working uh, with uh, the homelessness, specialist homelessness sector in social work education and very much appreciated uh, the comments in that direction. Um, but managed to time as well, Rob, so wonderful. Um, so in closing, uh, I, I really want to thank all the contributors to this very strong edition of Parity. Uh, thank all our presenters and contributors to uh, this launch today. Thank all of you on uh, who've been on and off the line uh, who have uh, attended the launch today. Um, and to also mention that at CHP, we're, we're very much into uh, monitoring and evaluation and feedback. And so we will be sent uh, a survey uh, not long after this uh, event. We genuinely would like your feedback um, to allow us to uh, improve on what we do and prepare for um, future sector events. I would like to again thank the sponsors um, who without this edition, without their contribution, uh, parity would not be possible. RMIT University, the University of South Australia, MacKillop Family Services, Sacred Heart Mission, Unity Housing South Australia, QUT, the University of Melbourne, the University of Sunshine Coast, uh, the ASW, and Multicultural Youth South Australia. Uh, thanks again to Noel um, for uh, bringing this edition together in partnership with so many of you uh, in, in the event today. Uh, and I do thank you all uh, sincerely and look forward to seeing you at future CHP events. Have a great weekend.